our last unit, we discussed the Fisher exact test for deciding whether a contingency table is significant or not. And we said some bad things about the Fisher exact test. We said that it wasn't conceptually as well founded as we would like because it didn't correspond to any real experimental protocol. And it's also difficult to compute in the case of a larger contingency table than 2 by 2. So in this unit, let's look at what seems to be a computationally good alternative to the Fisher exact test, and that's called the permutation test. So I'm going to illustrate it here on this very simple contingency table with small values 1, 3, 2, 1. But you'll see right away that this idea goes through for any values of the numbers and for any size of contingency table. The idea is that under the null hypothesis, if a count is in this row, say the F row, then it should be irrelevant which column it's in because there's no association between rows and columns. And similarly, if it's in a particular column, say the B column here, maybe one of these counts in three, it shouldn't matter which row it occurs in because that also is invariant under the null hypothesis. So we'll take the table and we'll expand it back into the data that it came from. Notice you can always do this. Here's one event which is an FA, so we put an FA in the first row. Here we have three events which have the combination FB. So we literally expand back to what the original data set looked like, three FBs right here, and so on. You'll see we have two GAs and one GB. Okay, having expanded back the data, we now randomly permute the second column of the data. Because under the null hypothesis, as we've said, there's no association between what value is written in the first column here and what value is written in the second column here. Notice here, by the way, that the fact that we have two columns is not because we had a 2 by 2 contingency table. Any contingency table, say one that had three columns and four rows, we would label, you know, they would each have a name, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, whatever it is, but when we expand it out, we'll still have a long vector here with just two columns in it. The length of this 2 by n matrix, of course, can get very long if the number of counts in the original contingency table is large. So what do we do? Well, we take this as data and we construct a new contingency table. And here you'll see I've done that. After I've permuted the data, there are two rows that have the combination FA. Let's find them. There, One is here and one is here. There are two um, rows that should have the combination FB. Let's see, here's one and where's the other one? It's down here. They're not going to be next to each other and so on. Well, what do we do with this new contingency table? We're still trying to do a p-value test, so we compute the statistic. For example, the Wald statistic that we saw in the previous segment, or the Pearson chi-square statistic, whatever statistic we're going to be using. And we save that, and now go back and do another permutation. So we go around this loop, which somehow came out figure eight shaped on my slide here, until we've accumulated a whole bunch of those statistics for the population of contingency tables under the null hypothesis. Now notice that as we do this, at every stage all the marginals are exactly preserved from the original contingency table. In the F row, 2 plus 2 is 4, and up here in the original data, 1 plus 3 is 4. Well, obviously they're all preserved because we have the same number of F events and G events as we did in the original data in this first column, and we have in the second column the same number of A's and B's as the original data. So if the permutation test preserves all the marginals, but otherwise combinatorially explores all the possible contingency tables, it is, in fact, the Fisher exact test. In fact, it's a Monte Carlo calculation of the Fisher exact test.
So our hope that we would get a test that had a conceptually better foundation than the Fisher exact test is not realized here. But our hope for a computationally straightforward of computing the Fisher exact test is realized, and that's the good thing about the permutation test. Notice that it's easy to compute for any size of table. So let's implement this by hand in MATLAB just to see how it works. Here I'm going to code up the walled statistic of a 2x2 two two table. So we're going to feed in a table and it's going to give out a walled statistic t, which you'll recall is asymptotically a t value, but for small values it's just what it is. It's just the walled statistic. And you can go back to the previous segment to see how you form that out of the column marginals mm and nn and you form these two estimates of the probability and then down here you compute the t-value. Okay, let's go back to one of our favorite tables here, this one here, that kind of looked significant but we were not sure how significant it is. And here's the table, I've just entered it in MATLAB and I'll compute its wall statistic. Well, its wall statistic comes out 2.05. If the number of counts were large, this would already say that we have a two standard deviation effect. That's a somewhat significant effect. But since the counts are small here, we're not really sure what is the significance of this walled statistic value. And we have to go on and figure out what the population is and therefore what the p-value really is. Now in scientific papers, you can therefore just as well say, I did the Fisher exact test on this data, or I did the permutation test on this data. And I think a lot of people say Fisher exact test either because they have no idea what test they actually did, they just use a statistics package somewhere, or because they think it sounds more educated, more learned to say Fisher exact test. But to me, it's a better idea to say, I did the permutation test because the permutation test it's very clear what exactly you did and against what null hypothesis namely the null hypothesis of invariance under permutation you were considering your data. So let's continue this example. Here in MATLAB I'm showing you how you go from a contingency table into that expanded n rows by two columns matrix. We're going to use the nd grid function that just generates an array here that tells each cell what its row and column number are. And then the tricky part here is that for each element in the original contingency table we're going to build up this n by 2 matrix by concatenating it with a number of repeated rows and those rows are just the row and column index that came out of this ND grid. So the MATLAB is a little confusing. You can read it from the inside out. I have to confess to you here that I always try to avoid loops in MATLAB because I really like its parallel language constructions and here when I first did this I couldn't think of any way to avoid the loop. So I actually called a friend in the uh, company that makes MATLAB, Peter Perkins, and I said, is there any way to do this without a loop? And he came up with this wonderfully obscure piece of code called that uses a function called RLDecode. And that's not even a MATLAB function. That's an add-on due to a person named Peter Acklam. That's just MATLABology. Anyway, let's see how this works. When I do this from our trial contingency table, I get a matrix D, and let's see if it has the expected sizes here. Yup, it's 53. That's the total number of events in the original contingency table, and it has two columns. And then we can also, just as a check, see that we can recover the original table. We can do that here using the array function in MATLAB that basically says take every row in the table D and stick it into a 2 by 2 matrix according to its address and indeed that gives the original contingency table. So now we can really get going. We want to, we're going to want to generate the walled statistic of a whole bunch of permutations of the uh, matrix D. So let's define a function. 
that will generate one such permutation. So let's read it from the inside out. We start with our n by 2, 53 by 2 matrix D, and we pick out a row that is a random value of the first column as opposed to just the whatever the value was in the second column. So that's picking out the random permute that this is making the random permutation. And then a cum array, as we've just showed up here, turns it back into a contingency table. And then Wald computes the statistic of that contingency table. So again, you've got to read it from the inside out, and it's a little tricky, but, but it does what we've been saying. Let's just try it out. Notice, by the way, that the argument x is never used. That's just a trick for being able to generate different random values every time I put a new argument in here. So if I call gen of 1, I get one random permutation of the contingency table, and I take its walled statistic, and it comes out this, minus 0.6676. Remember, the Wald statistic is like a t-value, and it can come out either positive or negative. OK, here we go. Let's do 100,000 of these permutations by using array fun to apply the gen function onto the arguments here between 1 and 100,000. So that generates a long vector of Wald function values, and we'll plot its histogram and its cumulative distribution function. Here they are. Under the null hypothesis, this should be the distribution of the Wald function for the, our particular contingency table. And you recall that the value of the Wald function for the true data was 2.05 approximately, so it falls into this bin right here. This should remind you of exactly the histogram that we saw in the previous segment when we did the Fisher exact test. Here I'm reminding you of it. The difference was there, the abscissa, the x-axis here, was just the value of m, the value in the upper left contingency table because we noticed that for monotonic statistics it didn't really matter what statistic you use. Here we're using an actual statistic, the Wald statistic, so that the abscissa here, ranging from negative to positive values, is the value of the Wald statistic. Let me come back to that in a minute because there's an important point lurking there. But what if I compute it here? Oh, I've just totaled up the total probability in these bins in various ways. Let's see what is the p-value that's greater than our measured p-value for the true data. So that's simply, we're going to count the number of elements in an array. The, this is our array of walled statistic values. And let's consider only those with values greater than the true value, the walled of table. OK, we'll count those number of elements, and we'll divide by the total of number of elements, and that's a probability. That's the sum of this bin and then a couple of invisible bins, because they're so small that you can't see here and here. Let's also compute the value similarly greater or equal to our observed value. Let's compute the two-tailed value. So notice how I do that. I'm counting the number of elements that have values greater than the at measured value, the data value, plus the number of elements with values less than minus the measured value. So that's flipping this arrow into its negative, which I've shown here as this arrow. So that's what we would get if we were doing a funny kind of a two-tailed test where we're insisting on strict greater than or strict equal to. But of course, the idea of any tail test is what is the probability of seeing a value as extreme or more extreme? So probably this is the better two-tailed test that we would want to do, two-tailed including the equal case, so with greater than or equal to signs here. And that's going to give a different value from the TT1. Why? Because it's going to include this whole bin in which the data lies.
Okay, so where did the values come out? Well, you can see some of these are exactly things that we've totaled up when we did the test this way. And we repeat, we get not quite exactly because we only did 100,000 iterations, but we get very close to the values for the Fisher exact test here. I told you that we would come back to the difference between what's the difference between this and what's the difference and this. And the answer to that lies in the two-tailed test. If we're doing a two-tailed test and we use the wall statistic, you'll notice that this arrow falls slightly to the left of this bin. And therefore, when we include the other tail, we'll, we're only including these other tiny bins. But we saw earlier when we did the Fisher exact test that that's a little bit arbitrary, that you could just as well define the what is what is the meaning of as or more extreme by how many bins are to the right of it or to the left of it. Another way of looking at this is that if instead of using the walled statistic I used some slightly different statistic and remember in a p-value test you pretty much get to make up what statistic you want to use so I might have wanted a statistic with slightly different properties and it could be that just because of the way the numbers fall, the kind of numerology of it, that this arrow would fall to the right of this bin instead of to the left of this bin, and then I'd get a rather different value for the two-tailed test. Let's play a little more with this very first contingency table that we looked at, the one about maternal drinking and congenital malformations. I mentioned to you that this was a nice textbook example of a contingency table. In fact, Agresti has pointed out that for this contingency table, applying different so-called standard methods, you can get p-values anywhere between a half a percent and almost 20%. So the ambiguity in p-value tests that we criticized in an earlier unit when we talked about Bayesian criticisms of p-value tests really apply to this particular contingency table. Now, Fisher's exact test done combinatorially on this, done the way we first saw Fisher's exact test, isn't very practical partly because we never derived how to do it in more than the 2x2 two two case, and partly because there are just a lot of hypergeometric functions and combinatoric stuff that you would have to do to do Fisher exact test on this. So this is a good candidate for the permutation test. And let's try it. Just as before, we're going to expand the table and generate a thousand permutations. Here only a thousand permutations because when we expand the table we get something with more than 30,000 rows because of these large numbers of counts. And I didn't want to take more than a minute computing it just on my laptop, so that limited me to a thousand permutations. Here's a good exercise for you. You don't really have to expand the table into these long, long vectors. You can conceptually do that and then figure out how to do the permutation test without it's expanding all the data actually. So why don't you go off and do that after you listen to this segment, figure out how to do that. But we'll just do it the, the long way. We start with our table as before. I'm now going to use the Pearson statistic just to show you a, a different example instead of using the Wald statistic. So the Pearson statistic applied to the real data gives a value 12.08. Now here is my practice of uh, setting up ND grid, setting up an empty matrix, looping through all of the elements in the table. That's not the large number, that's just these 10 uh, cells here in the table, and concatenating the appropriate number of rows to now get a matrix D whose size, as you see, is 32,574 rows by two columns. And we can check using a QM array that we can get back the original table. This is just to build confidence that we understand the MATLAB coding. Here's our function now for generating one permutation. Looks pretty much the same, except it has Pearson out here instead of Wald. Let's just generate one permutation. <coughs> 
and we get an answer 1.3378. Ah, oh, that seems pretty different from the Pearson value here, so maybe we're onto something. Maybe we've got a significant table here. But to find out, we actually have to generate a population of values of the Pearson statistic, a thousand of them, and we'll plot their histogram and their cumulative distribution function. And as before, we'll compute the tail values, the number of values that we see under the null hypothesis greater than the observed value, or just to see if it makes any difference greater or equal. Here I'm definitely doing just a one-tailed test because we don't really think that maternal drinking is going to improve the quality of the fetus. So here's the histogram and our real data was at what was it 12 point something so it's out here and you see that the area under the curve to the right of the true value, the sum of these little ratty histogram bins, is about 3.8 percent. And it's also 3.8 percent when we include the bin we're in. That's because each of these bins has just a tiny little probability in it. And therefore, the maternal drinking table is statistically significant at a p-value of 3.8 percent. Well, there are two questions that remain. First of all, we really did, although we did it by Monte Carlo, Fisher's exact test. And that holds all the marginals fixed, and that's not the way the data in the maternal drinking table was gathered. So we want to ask, was this a good or bad approximation to do? It might be that it's a perfectly good approximation. In fact, we'll see that, it, that it's very, very close. But conceptually, that's an important question. Then there's a second, slightly more subtle question that we'll come back to, and that is the question, is there a more powerful statistical test for this data than simply doing the permutation test or Fisher's test on the contingency table? And we'll see that there is a more powerful approach.